the Joe Rogan experience. When people, you know, like the idea of backpacking hunting, that's what they're liking is the idea of it. Because Cam yeah. glamorized the shit out of it. It's but again, fucking painful. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a normal human. You can't go by his standards, no. or his ideas. They say that sheep hunting is the hardest. They say that, uh, like, like Alaska sheep hunting, in terms of like just the difficulty of the terrain and the the dangers of it. Yeah, you agree um, with that. Somewhat, yeah. I would say the one, I've only been on a couple sheep hunts in Alaska, right? Most of mine have been in Lower Forty Eight or the NWT, um, the Northwest Territories. The thing with Alaska that's easy is you're not gaining that much altitude. Distance is far. You're not, but the weather is bad. Like generally the weather's pretty bad. And then that the amount of pressure now, and again, I'm not an expert on Alaska. The pressure is much worse than it's ever been in Alaska. In terms of the amount of hunters. Hunters. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of hunters out there. Yeah. And then animals, Mm -hmm. grizzlies and shit. Yeah. Which is a fucking real, you've seen us get charged on video. I think. Yes. When you were with the gritty Bowman, that was terrifying. Yeah. That was crazy. I, uh, tell I'm an adrenaline junkie. (laughs) I'll tell a true story. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> it's not, I thought I, we were calling it moose, and I'm like, look in, and I'm like, I think there's a moose coming, and a grizzly pops out. I'm like, hey, get your camera. Let's call this thing in. It, and this is a true story, right? Because we made it sound like it was, uh, you know, oh, here comes a grizzly. So I thought it was going to get to that fucking stump and stop, right? You called the grizzly in on purpose? It was coming into a moose call, right? So oh, no. I'm like, hey grab the cameras let's get this on video because he was looking for our moose calls so this big bitch gets by that log and she stands up she's looking around and i'm like oh cool you can hear my shutter on the video fuck it hit the ground and it was coming and i'm like oh well and immediately me i've been charged enough to where i'm i'm an adrenaline junkie anyway i'm desensitized and i'm like well he's gonna eat fucking this other dude anyway so i'm like you can see my camera's shifting right a little as i'm taking these photos i didn't have a weapon i had a bow And so here pretty quick, I'm thinking, shoot this motherfucker. It's like 15 yards from us. Oh, my God. And he fired off around at its feet, and I knew his gun jammed on the second round uh, sometimes. So I'm like, that fucking piece of shit, Brownie Abel, doesn't jam on this second one or whatever it was, right? Um, Not saying a Browning's bad. Well, it stopped, do you remember? And it came again. Mm -hmm. I think it was like 12, 10 yards when it finally turned off and and ran away. 10 yards is nothing. Well, I tell you, like, mm, that's almost like that wall. <laughs> yeah, it was big, too. It's a big one. For example, I start the book with a quote from the head of Philip Morris, who says, who knows what you would do if you didn't smoke? Maybe you'd beat your wife. Maybe you'd yeah. drive cars fast. And, you know, that that's part of how I think the tobacco industry approached this. They would they would imagine this sort of counterfactual uh, where, you know, a world without tobacco, without cigarettes, and then they would imagine what that would be like. And, of course, they'd always imagine it was much, much, much worse much, than much worse, smoking, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I read that part. And also that the man in question wound up quitting cigarettes. So right, yeah, he, he had to quit fairly quickly. And speeding and <laughs> what, did, what did he do? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that was the question. And, and we never really did find that out. It's such a strange way to live your life. To, to be deceptive in a way that you know is going to, I mean, the, there's, I don't know how many people have gotten cancer from cigarettes, but it's probably millions. Well, and it isn't just cancer, it's a heart yeah. disease, et cetera. So yeah. millions, I mean, I, I've seen an estimate that in the 20th century, smoking killed, I want to make sure I get this right, I think it was 100 million people. Oh more than More than maybe both wars world wars put together it's seven million a year i think is the is the global death toll in the u.s it's uh, four hundred and eighty thousand a yeah. year yeah mm-hmm. directly attributable right they trace yeah. they trace it to to uh, directly attributable now you know it, it these are extreme examples tobacco is the most famous and extreme example and i talk about a lot of other examples but i think it's actually you know, a fairly common thing for people to go pretty far down the road of denial when they are working in an industry. And and this is sort of the process I try to explore a little bit in the book. They're working in an industry. They're confronted with some accusation that they have caused harm. They check their gut. And their gut says, no, we didn't intend to cause harm. We don't feel guilty. And mm. so their mind starts to come up with reasons why it must be wrong. And their tribal instincts, which are never more than just a millimeter below the surface for 
pretty much any of us, but, but certainly in this case, get triggered. So uh, they immediately think, well, these people accusing me must have an ulterior motive. They must be, they want money, they want power, they want attention, they've got some sinister political objective. Uh, and then the, the other part of that tribal dynamic is they start thinking about themselves uh, and, and their truly lofty mission, which isn't just to sell a product, but something else. It's to protect freedom. Or if you're a slave trader, it's to rescue the Africans from terrible lives in Africa and bring them to the comfortable plantations. A micro assault would be, um, you know, making a, a, a small but, you know, racially salient comment in the presence of a person of that race. Oh, so it's not even not necessarily assault, racist. Assault. No, it's not an assault. No, these people violence is all words and and, and discursive. So a micro assault can just be an insult. And they're all insults. Micro everything has to just be like words or standing in the wrong place. Oh boy, Jamie just pulled it up here. A micro assault is an explicit racial derogations <laughs> characterized. What is that? How look at that expression. A micro assault is an explicit racial derogations. So you've put somebody down on purpose. I know, but that's a weird w way of describing an explicit racial derogations, plural. Oh yeah, Some, n, who wrote which is that? singular. Yeah, that's then, not right. Yeah, they need an editor. Derogations, plural, characterized primarily by a verbal or nonverbal attack, meant to hurt the intended victim through name calling. There's your hyphen. Avoidant behavior <laughs> or purposeful discriminatory dot actions. <laughs> yeah, the dot. grammar on that's broken all to pieces. It's a mess. And that's uh, kzoo.edu, reason.kzoo.edu. Nice. I mean, yeah, it's that, like they all didn't these... even bother like editing that motherfucker. Look there, at that. <laughs> there's so many of these things that are like for education that are like this. Oh. And it's like the, it, they say stuff like themselves. And it's just mm. like. This is supposed to be for education. It's barely literate. What is right. going on? Well, that's a problem when you're using they and them as well, right? You yeah. start using they and them pronouns, which are really supposed to, I mean, f for the most part, indicate multiple people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The I mean, singular you could say they. They, you know, so this guy, what, what you could say they thought or they thought they would get away with it. I mean, you could say it. You could right. say. Right. Right. But it's hard to use it that way all the time. Right. It's hard to use it intentionally, yes. actually. It's, it's, it comes up naturally sometimes, and then it's fine, but it's hard to use intentionally. Yeah. If a person wanted to go to the store, they could go. Right. And yeah. so there's something like kind of totalitarian about making people do things like that that are difficult, yes. like jumping through these little hoops and then yes. holding them to massive account. Yes. And it's like, I mean, even like the Black Lives Matter thing, like Black Lives Matter as a sentence is obvious. Forcing somebody to say an obvious thing. That's a great name because you can't argue with it. You also can't argue yeah, with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah of course what are you they say? matter. And of course, it's, I mean, it's so complicated because it's like if somebody asked me, they said, okay, do you support Black Lives Matter? James, do you support Black Lives Matter? And of course, they're going to try to catch me on this. And it's like, which one? There's at least five. I support one of them and I think the other four are nuts. I was at his house uh, January of last year, January 2019. Tiffany Haddish took me to his house. And uh, it was this night that I was really not supposed to be there. I wasn't invited, but Tiffany was like, come with me. And I'm like, hell yeah. So I went and it was the, it was this incredible fucking night at Eddie Murphy's house where um, I walked downstairs. The first person I see is Jamie Foxx. I was like, hey, man, what's up? I'm like, what's up, Jamie? And he's like, yeah. And then, uh, and then I turn, I see Neil Brennan. And then, I, and then I look at the bar and I see Sasha Baron Cohen and Isla Fisher sitting at the bar. And I'm like, what the fuck have I watched? Then I see Kimmel. Then I see Bill Hader, and then I hear behind me, yo, is this what you comedians always do, hang out with each other? And I turn around, and it's Q-Tip from a tribe called Quest, and I'm like, what up, Tip? And they're like, what the fuck is going, what have I walked into? Wow. And, uh, and then Jeff Ross was there, and then Chappelle came, Chris Rock came. Whoa. And I was like, what have I fucking walked into? But the good thing is, you know, because you were comics, we all know each other. And then, I, you know, I'd only met Eddie once for like a split second at a fight. And uh, he knew my name then, but when I walked when I walked in the basement, he goes, "Hey, Russell, thanks for coming." I'm like, "Eddie Murphy knows my name." <laughs> that's, that's all I could think. Of. <laughs> Holy shit, Eddie Murphy knows my name. I met him once with Charlie. I ran into Charlie. And Charlie was so great. He, he was, was such best. a sweet guy. Charlie and I did a tour together uh, for uh, Maxim, <clears throat> the Bud Light comedy tour, and um, with John Heffron, and then just randomly. Uh, 
I was in Maui, and just Charlie was in Maui. And uh, I went over and uh, sat with him and Eddie Murphy. It was weird. It was so strange. How was he when he was with Charlie? He was real friendly, man. Real yeah, he friendly. was really nice. There was, like, nothing weird about him. And no, he's super friendly. His first words, he goes, you're a funny motherfucker. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, these are the things. Am I faint? <laughs> yeah, uh, dude. I... Uh... I, I was like that whole night. I honestly didn't say a fucking word to anybody. I was just in shock the entire time. I was just like, I know. Right? Every time I turned my head, and then I was standing in a doorway, like that, and it's, it's me standing beside Eddie, and then Chris Rock, Jamie Foxx, and Neil Brennan, and they're all trying to convince him to do stand up again. Wow. And I'm just there, like. I have nothing to add to this conversation. <laughs> like, I'm not on Jamie's level. I'm not on Chris's level. You know, Neil created Chappelle's. I'm like, I'm just there. But they didn't make me feel like, what are you doing here? They made me feel included. So that was nice. But That is nice. But, uh, they, you know, there was like, Eddie was like, I haven't done it in 30 years. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you've still got it. Oh, he's got it. He, you... said, he said he's got about five minutes. Uh, I got about five minutes. But, you know, you guys are out there doing it every day. And I know he, I know he wants to do it. 